peace be unto you from God our Father and our Savior, Jesus Christ, our dear Lord of the Church. Amen. Uh, to begin the sermon this morning, I'm going to have uh, Julie play a video clip from a book that I was given when my daughter Lauren was born, her first child. And some of you parents or grandparents may know this I Love You Forever book. It is absolutely wonderful. It's about eight minutes, so hang in there. Don't worry, I'm not going to preach so long so that we're going to go over one hour because I know how you all can be. But it's a wonderful introduction into the sermon. So go ahead, Julius. My mother held her new baby, and very slowly walking back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And while she held him, she sang, I'll love you forever, I'll like you for always, as long as I'm living, my baby can be. The baby grew, it grew, and it grew, and it grew. He grew until he was two years old, and he ran all around the house. He pulled all the books off the shelves. He pulled all the food out of the refrigerator, and he took his mother's watch and flushed it down the toilet. <laughs> Sometimes his mother would say, this kid is trying to be crazy. But at nighttime, when that two-year-old was quiet, she opened the door to his room. Crawled across the floor, looked up on the side of his bed, and he was really asleep. She picked him up and walked him back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. While she rocked him, she sang, I'll love you forever, I'll like you for always, as long as I'm living. The little boy grew. He grew and he grew and he grew. He grew until he was nine years old. And he never wanted to come in for dinner. He never wanted to take a bath. And my grandma always did. He always said bad words. Sometimes his mother wanted to sell him to the zoo. But at nighttime, when he was asleep, the mother quietly opened the door to his room, crawled across the floor, and looked up over the side of the bed. If he was really asleep, she picked up that nine-year-old boy and rocked him back and forth. Thank <laughs> you. 
This sentence is grammatically correct. And drove across town. <laughs> if all the lights in her son's house were out, she opened his bedroom window, crawled across the floor, and looked up over the side of his bed. If that great big man was really asleep, she picked him up and rocked him back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And while she rocked him, she sang, I'll love you forever, I'll like you for always, as long as I'm living. She got older and older and older. One day she called up her son and said, You better come see me because I'm very old and sick. So her son came to see her. When he came in the door, she tried to sing the song. She sang, I'll love you forever. I'll like you for all ways. But she couldn't finish because she was too old and sick. The son went to his mother. He picked her up and brought her back and forth. Back and forth. Back and forth. And he sang this song. I'll love you forever. I'll like you for always. As long as I'm living, my mommy will be. When the son came home that night, he stood for a long time at the top of the stairs. And then he went into the room where his very new baby daughter was sleeping. He picked her up in his arms and very slowly rocked her back and forth. God likes to love you. 
The psalmist says this, we are the apple of his eye. And it could mean we're the little man of his eye, the little boy of his eye, the little girl of his eye, uh, the little woman of his eye. But it's based on the idea when you get really close to someone, when you really love them, and you make eye contact, and you get up close and personal, and you see in their eye a reflection of your image. We're the apple of God's eyes. Now, of course, lovers don't always sing love songs. Sometimes they sing the blues, don't they? So does God. When Israel was a child, I loved him, and the more I called him, the more Israel went away from me, God says. My people are bent on turning away from me. But that's us, and that's our nature. Uh, St. Augustine, the great church father, had this Latin phrase, incurvitas and say, life is turned in upon itself. We become navel gazers. And what's most important is not so much what God says, what God wants, but what I say, what I want, what I think, and what I feel. And that becomes ultimate. And that becomes transcendent. And so we go our own way. A few Sundays ago, Jesus says, I'm the good shepherd, and he calls us all sheep. And if you were here, we talked about the fact that sheep are D-U-M, dumb. Dumb. Because we go our own way. And that's exactly what happens, and that's what God says. God sings the blues. But in spite of the fact that you and I go our own way, God has supremely what lovers, all lovers have to some degree, what Charles Williams, the great writer, called the gift of double vision. I love this. God sees with utter clarity who we are. He's undeceived by our warts, our mistakes, our wickedness, our evil, and our sin. But when God looks at you and me, it's not all that he sees. Because when he looks at us in Christ, he sees Christ. He sees Christ's life and death and resurrection. When he looks at you and me, he sees shed blood over you and me. He sees who we are intended to be, who we will one day become. By the way, as a parent, didn't you all do this with your kids? Sometimes you have those moments when you want to throttle them. You ever have those moments when they're awake and then they go to sleep? And yet after you say your nighttime prayers and they go to sleep, you ever do this? You go back in there, you open up the door, you look at them, they're sleeping. And you can't get enough of them. That is precisely what God says and feels and thinks about us. He sees where we are going and he sees what we can become. Because love alone truly sees with double vision. There's an old stupid saying out there that love is blind. It's not so. No. Love sees everything and still loves. And in the act of loving, in the act of seeing, God calls out of you and me the kind of people that he has called us to be. And he wants to make visible one day for all of us to see. But not only does God see God does something that every mother does. God touches. Um, I'm always amazed how a touch from a mom can heal a hurt. Isn't it amazing? I remember playing sports. If I fell down and hurt, if there wasn't a bone sticking out of my knee, uh, my leg, my dad would say, suck it up. My mom, honey, honey. And what do you do? What do little kids do? They go run to mom, and it's, it's amazingly powerful how much magic you moms have. You kiss the boo-boo goodbye. <laughs> go figure. Jesus does the same. He touches those who are hurt. He touches people that nobody would touch. He touches lepers, and they were unclean. And in fact, if you came 50 yards, uh, to a leper, they had to shut at the top of their lungs unclean. Nobody would go near a leper because you'd be infected. But with Jesus, the leprosy didn't infect Jesus with his sickness. Jesus infected the leper with his life. It's what we might call the immaculate infection and the life of Jesus and the forgiveness of sins from Jesus flowed from Jesus. It was so strong that leprosy could not exist nor could sin. This has been one heck of a year with COVID. And all we talk about is infection, infection, infection. I infected, I can infect somebody, and on and on and on. Are you contagious? COVID is contagious. 
Sin and suffering are contagious. But that's not all. So is laughter. So is love. So is enthusiasm. So is faith. So is goodness. So is beauty. Get around somebody who has all those things and you begin to discover how contagious they are. And I want to rub shoulders, rub elbows with those kinds of people. You know, Jesus twice used the image of yeast in his teaching. And yeast is always a picture of contagion. You put a little lump in a batch of dough and soon the whole thing is leavened. One bad apple can spoil the whole bunch, right? Sin is that way. We all know that. I have three brothers, so four boys. Mom would always say this, one boy, one brain. Two boys, half a brain. Three boys, no brain. It's contagious. <laughs> and it is. But in Matthew 13, Jesus uses yeast to describe something else. The kingdom of God. And he says, the kingdom of God is just like that. It's going to take off. It's just a matter of time before it grows. It can't be stopped. And ever since Jesus, the yeast has been at work. Folks, it may look small, it may look insignificant, a storefront church in a burned out city, a congregation sitting around for years, not doing much, a small group praying. Jesus says you keep watching. Only be patient, patient, because the darkness doesn't stand a chance. Isn't that a great word for St. Mark's Lutheran Church in the year 2021 of our Lord? The darkness doesn't stand a chance. Because the secret to spiritual life is not to isolate ourselves from sin and suffering. It's impossible. Jesus lived on the same contaminated planet as the rest of us, but he was immune. And our systems are broken down. The secret is to be so filled with the life of Jesus Christ that in touching the world, instead of the world infecting us, somehow we infect it. In the Gospel of Mark, the leper gets healed. He's the ex-leper, but now he's got a bug. He is contagious, and he just couldn't help it. He was told to be silent, but he couldn't. He couldn't be silent. His faith was infectious, so much so that Mark says, it began to spread like a germ, like a bad cold, like a hot rumor, and everybody caught it. And people came from everywhere to find out what in the world is going on with this ex-leper. And ever since then, those who have been touched by Jesus have gone out spreading germs. Little joy germs, faith germs, belief bacteria, love germs changing the world now and forever. We live in a contaminated planet, and it's contaminated on every level, and it should have been quarantined from heaven. No reasonable God would go near it with a 10-foot pole. But Jesus Christ is not a reasonable God. He became a human being. He took on our uncleanness and all of our sin into his own body. But instead of the world infecting him, he infected the world with his immaculate infection and its spreading. And guys, i got to tell you, it's just a matter of time. Because Jesus says to you and me, I love you forever. I like you for always. My baby, you will be. God grant that for Jesus' sake. Amen. And now may the peace of Christ that goes beyond all understanding keep your hearts and minds through faith unto life eternal. Amen.